Okay, um, hi, my name is James Latimer. I'm one of the artistic curators at Documenta Madrid. And I'm very happy to be here with Luke Fowler, who is the subject of one of our retrospectives here at the festival in collaboration with the Museo Reina Sofia. The retrospective is called A Certain Predilection for Things Out of the Ordinary. And um, yeah, first and foremost, welcome, Luke. Thank you for taking the time. To Thanks, to James. Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. So um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about portraiture, because I think that's a thread that kind of, I think, runs through your entire work. And if you if one thinks about the sort of people that you create portraits of, they tend to be outsider figures, countercultural figures, people maybe that don't normally receive, that are not normally put in the spotlight, shall we say. And so to start off, I was thinking about, um, yeah, how do you go about choosing these figures or in a sense, deciding to dedicate an entire film to these figures. And what's the process of research? Because obviously your films are not the sort of films that are particularly interested in narrating a life story in a conventional way, or kind of, you know, picking up on a sort of key moment and amplifying that. But in a sense, your approach maybe on some level requires even more research because it isn't sticking to those kind of more tried and tested structures of, of biography. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... So I suppose when I started making out making films, started making films um, at the end of the 90s um, in, my, in my final year at art school, um, video art was the prevalent um, you know, art form that you would see in galleries. And um, there wasn't this sort of um, preponse, um, proliferation of, of sort of artists using film or, or artists making essays. And, um, you know, it was, it was very much the sort of the time of, of Douglas Gordon and Bill Viola, of, mm. you know, that still exploring video um, as an extension of, of sculpture, you know. Um, so that, <clears throat> that's very much like, as an artist, what I was um, sort of grounded in in Dundee, in, in the art college at Dundee. Um, I studied in printmaking, but there was also this parallel, I mean, one of the, uh, the principle of printmaking was called Elaine Schemmelt, and she was the partner of Stephen Partridge who ran the time-based art department. Okay. And time-based art was like a really groundbreaking course in, um, in Dundee. Um, because Steve had studied with like David Hall, so one of the pioneers of of video art, mm. um, and they were they were very quick and very fast to to um, equip themselves with early video technology. Um, <clears throat> so that was you know I was exposed to um, a lot of early video art, and then also to. Um, when I grew up, my dad um, was an omnivorous television viewer and um, would also go to the, to the pictures and to, to the theatre and take mm. me along. So I had this sort of cultural grounding in popular culture, but also in, I suppose, what you could call kind of, uh, you know, just a sort of... Um, Harold Pinter and Beckett and you okay, know, okay. Um, classics, you know, the, so, mm. and and um, <clears throat> they and and that was really a golden period of television as well on Channel Four. Um, I don't know if you grew up in the in the eighties watching television in Britain, James. Uh, I did indeed. I did indeed. I know yeah. exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So, so you can testify to sure. To, to the uh, this golden age of television, of, of Arena, of Melvin Bragg. Sure, know. it was a very different landscape at that point. It's changed vastly since then, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, <clears throat> I think uh, I had to um, come to terms with those two different influences, you know, that influence mm. of, of wanting to speak about culture and wanting to speak about I big ideas. Mm. But also um, to be reflexive and and to work in that in that tradition of of criticality and critical oh. research that um, that fine art came in, fine art video came in, um, 
And I think uh, I am getting to your answer. <laughs> along oh, no, 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 it's great to have some background noise. It's amazing. A long-winded way, but, um, you know, I, I think the, what the real turning point for me was seeing um, artists like Dan Graham and Johan Grimman Prez's essays. Mm. And all, all of a sudden, you know, they were, they were pulling on these sort of vernacular forms of documentary, mm. but subverting them for their own means, you know, to make artworks, to make, to make uh, authored essays. And um, that was a kind of permission, I suppose, for me mm. to find my own way into to the, the kind of film practice that I'm still working on, you know, it's an ongoing mm. project. And um, in terms of portraiture, you know, <clears throat> I mean, obviously uh, art has a, has a very strong history of portraiture. Um, and um, I never really kind of thought of myself as being a, a, a portraitist. Um, mm. And it's, it sort of happened by accident, <laughs> just fall, <laughs> falling into it. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, I, I read biographies and, and I'm interested in other people. I'm interested in social experience mm. and lived experience. Um, and I suppose um, a lot of what governs the dis, my decisions in making a film is thinking about the present time and thinking about, and then sort of this research into to how people lived in, you know, previous experience and previous mm -hmm. lives and the possibility that we could live our lives and renew our lives with different values than the ones that are being entrenched now sure. through a, a, a very much neoliberal prism. No, because I think there is something very, I mean, in a lot of your films, I think there is something very utopian. I mean, Patrick, I think also really captures that kind of feeling of a kind of a, a different possibility or a different kind of, yeah, a different past that could have become a different future and maybe didn't or maybe did, but not in a one-to-one -one or in a linear way. Oh. Yeah, and I, I suppose I'm, I'm also interested in I'm complicating um, and uh, complicating the idea of the person, of personhood mm. and, and what constitutes a person. And I think this, again, like, you know, seeing something like Wavelength or, you know, um, Hollis Frampton's films mm -hmm. for me was very important in terms of thinking about um, the idea of, of film embodying consciousness, you sure. know, the project of taking on, um, you know, conscious tackling ideas such as um, ontology and consciousness mm -hmm. uh, within filmmaking. And documentary and portraiture is usually, <clears throat> I mean, narrative film is usually so reductive in how it portrays people. And so in, in, my, in my films, I'm often saying, you know, um, these are uh, uh, short, you know, this is, these are fragmentary, you know, and, and um, incomplete and, and ex, um, impressionistic, you know, totally. studies and, and are, and in many ways, they, they often try and restrict what they're talking about rather than encompassing a whole life. You know, they try and look at micro histories. Exactly. Um, or, or micro social moments within um, an individual's life. And, and so rather than having this um, holistic view of, of, a, of a whole life and are trying to, to, to talk of a whole life to, to maybe talk about a life in fragments and pieces. No, for sure. And I think, I think it's interesting you talking about this sort of idea of film as consciousness, because I think a lot of your films do function in a sense, they work like a representation of a thought process or of an idea of kind of, you know, you kind of, you read this thing, you see this thing, you hear about that thing and you make connections between them. And those connections are somehow very, I mean, uh, I mean, in the mind, they are in flux. They're changing the whole time. New impressions come, new connections are made. Connections are made that have nothing to do with that person because they're yeah. always linked to the person making the film. And, and there is this sort of idea of a, of a kind of, yeah, a modeling of a, of a consciousness that is in interaction with a past consciousness that one can obviously never kind of gain a completeness of. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I've always 
maintained that I, I think, you know, I kind of work between these two different <clears throat> strands of filmmaking, you know, of coming from art um, and um, conceptual art and, and social practice and then also coming from popular culture and film and experimental film mm. and, um, and, and documentary, you know, very much sort of grew up with, with that exposure to, to documentary and having nothing, no problem whatsoever with the, you know, idea of, of um, pe the pedagogical model within, you know, documentary. Um, I don't, I don't have a problem with that, you know. I mean, I've got a problem with the authoritarian model of documentary. So, that's a fine line. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think what, <clears throat> yeah, what, what I was going to say was that for me, for, I, I see, sort of see film, my filmmaking as, more within situated within ideas of fluxus or or you know sort of ideas from cage um, mm -hmm. or, or from personal filmmaking you know where it isn't predetermined you know there isn't this um positivist sure. uh, model of filmmaking where i am going out to prove a thesis or i'm going out to make a portrait and here is my storyboard or this is my you know script you know, these films are a part of, you know, I make them for myself and I make them for my peer, you know, people, hopefully for an audience, but um, ultimately these, these films are, are a reflexive and an autodidactic process. You know, they document my life, they document my um, thinking and, and they're a way of growing, you know, with the person and, and thinking through you know, this other individual. So that's what's, to me, when I choose a subject, it has to be someone that um, has scope to think through, you know, who, who's, whose prism is something that is rich and complex and um, that I can dwell in those, in those ideas and, and be nourished by those ideas for years mm -hmm. to come. Because I know that in 10 years time now, I'm still going to be talking about Patrick Kelly. I'm still going to be talking about R.D. Lane. I'm still going to be talking about uh, Mar uh, Margaret Tate, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, that's a wonderful thing, actually, that that process continues. Yeah, they're, they're, it's kind of like storytelling, you know, um, Scottish traditional storytelling has, has had this view of, you know, when you tell a story, you're standing on the shoulders of your elders, of those that have gone back before, you know, and um, it's you haven't invented the story. You know, mm. you're just adding your your voice to it. You know, your your own version to it, and, and you're perpetuating it. You know, and mm. keeping it alive. And that's what I feel like. Why I'm trying to do. I'm trying to keep alive stories that I feel are in danger of being marginalised or misrepresented by a dominant um, capitalist culture that um, wants to erase difference, you know. And the modern essentially, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That wants to whitewash mm. uh, history. Totally. I mean, what, I mean, I was thinking about, um, thinking about one film in particular to the editor of Amateur Photographer. I think there's that super interesting scene in the film where there's this kind of conversation between two of the women from Pavilion talking about, okay, you know, for us it feels strange that there's a man making a film about feminist photographers. And, um, you know, I think, I mean, that's one example, but I think it's very interesting that, you know, some of the subjects that you, or some of the people that you create portraits of are very different from your, from, you know, your own experience or very detached from your own experience, you know, gay men, women, et cetera. And I was wondering what are the sort of the challenges of, of, of doing that, of, you know, trying to, because, you know, obviously as we talked about this sort of idea of incorporating yourself into the process, but also trying to, trying to engage with people who, who are, who are is actually different. And also the kind of, the difference with make, you know, some of your films are obviously about people who are no longer around and also how that then affects the process. Because obviously, you know, if you can sit and have a conversation with someone, it's one thing. If you can't, it's another. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think to answer your first question, for, for me, filmmaking is about empathy and it's about mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. um, different positions from one's own. 
And if we don't look outside, you know, our own house and our own, you know, milieu, then, you know, how are we going to learn? How are we going to grow as individual, as a society? You know, completely. Um, we're we're just self-serving and and solipsistic, and um, and you know, you could see this with with the current Tory government in in, in power. You very know, much, oh, it, it's very much tokenistic the way that um, the people engage with different cultures different from their own. Mm. And um, yeah, I'm taking risks. I'm, I, I feel like I'm taking risks in, in that um, I'm going into territory where I'm, I'm being criticized, where I could be criticized, you know, for being um, an outsider. <clears throat> but I'm hopefully not, you know, trying to um, go about making a film where I'm not speaking on behalf of other, of, of other people, you know, and I'm not, um, you know, I think the question of interpretation is really thorny and, tri- and, and the questions of representation are, mm-hmm. are thorny, but um, it's, it's about, you know, solidarity really. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, solidarity and empathy. Mm. Or, also, for, different, for different positions and 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 not seeing seeing it as an us and them you know um <clears throat> yeah so it, it's kind of not putting compartmentalizing people and seeing them as like okay this is a this is a gay community this is a black community this is you know um you know a community whatever um you know feminist community you know it's saying that we're all part of a community you know of course respecting that those communities have have histories and have differences mm. and have had, had different experiences and you know you've got to accept that these you have blind spots you know in your thinking um as and, and privileges in the in your thinking and that we're have an embodied thinking you know um, so, but unless you talk to other people about their lived experiences, then you're never going to see your blind spots. You're never going to see your privileges. You're never going to see things from a different perspective. Mm. And you're just trapped in this feedback loop of recreating your own, you know, your, your own views. For sure. No, and I think also this, I mean, what you talked about already, this idea, because I think, um, you know, as soon as you yourself, whether in an explicit way or an implicit way, are kind of visible in the process, then it becomes clear that there's this kind of organizing presence that is kind of also obviously has its own thoughts, its own, its own you know, I, I think it, I think it always it only ever becomes tricky when, in a sense, that's that's invisible or when there's this kind of yeah. sense, of, okay, there's like this kind of omnipresent figure that knows everything and is trying to kind of yeah. Uh, and you know, I I could quite easily go on making films that don't have, um, you know, aren't awkward, are not awkward to make, are not mm. you know, do not have a rub in them, you know, do not have, um, you know, self questioning and self doubt. Um, but are we really growing as individuals as a, as a species if we don't? If we're asking those questions, sure. Asking those questions, so yeah, um, that that's sort of my position on that, and I, I'm sure you know people have <laughs> different positions, but you know, it, I think it's just not about kind of going in with a set of um, you know car- a character armor that is you know a defensive position you know where i or or um the position of knowing and of talking down to people you know and saying and and of of dominate dominating through the through the prism of the of of the camera for of the lens you know like mm-hmm. this is my film i'm telling that has always been the authoritarian mode of of documentary mm-hmm. And if we reject that and if we say, well, this is actually, um, you know, a history of community filmmaking and a, a history of collaboration, you know, um, um, then, then we can see things from a different perspective. 
or what are your assumptions, you know? Oh, sure, 100%. I mean, some of your subjects are also musicians, and we've already mentioned a couple of them, but, um, and that's what the first program in the retrospective covers. Um, and what are the, if thinking, thinking about musicians in particular, what are the specific challenges of creating a portrait of a musician as opposed to someone, I mean, not a musician? And also because so much of that is to do with, I mean, I think Patrick is a great example of that, but um, Electro Pythagoras too, how, like trying to convey the feelings attached to music or the sensations imparted by music within a film, which is obviously a very different, a medium which requires a very different set of coordinates. And also how does your own work in making music help in that process of kind of conveying music, shall we say? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, th I think, um... <clears throat> you know, um, filmmaking is an ocular centric medium mm. uh, and it privileges the eye over the ear. Even, cool. even with films about sound or about musicians, they're generally, um, you know, privileging what they say and how they're filmed and the pro filmic rather than um, privileging sound or privileging, you know, at the musician at the music um so i think this this idea of the of of how to marry sound and image you know in a way where one isn't just imitating or or illustrating the other you know um as bresson sort of talked about this idea of you know if we uh, if if one if the sound basically reproduces what an image is or says the same as the image, then just cut it, you know, it's not necessary and vice versa. Um, <clears throat> I think in terms of music, you know, I'm very conscious of the differences between the cinema and a concert, you know. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of the different, those different experiences and the physicality of music mm. and also um you know it's not a a direct kind of corrective or correlative you know equivalent you know um a, a filmed concert is not the same as seeing no, not a concert mm -hmm. so um you know when i make a film about a musician i suppose i'm thinking about how do I how do I convey the power of the music, this power the the the, um, the sensorial um, qualities of this of this music, um, whilst also providing kind of an insight into the person that made it, you know, mm. and into their you know their world their. How, how these things kind of, you know, came about. And, and um, I mean, in terms of <clears throat> talking specifically about say someone like Martin Bartlett, again, it's, I mean, yes, yeah, it's, it's about music, but it's also about, and it's about Martin, but quite often the musician is a kind of cipher to talk about other ideas and talk, to talk about, you know, contemporary culture and how did we get to this place that we are we're at now you know um when again talking looking back at these sort of utopian moments when things were up for grabs so the nascent period of like computer music mm. when the composer was writing their own computer music programs you know they were writing the programs they were writing the software and that was um, you know, part of the, the composition, as Martin did, you know, he wrote his own software. Um, and that became almost an extension of the score. But now, you know, we've got to this point where, you know, computer music and um, computer music software is a commercial business. And we're not, you know, we're like writing it. things within packages and within a, a, a reductive framework that is someone else's um, concept of, you know, 
what tools do musicians mostly need? So it's a generalized language for music making. Mm -hmm. um, and it, in a way, it's calcified into to genres. So, you know, you, know, you have your, um, you know, use Ableton to make dance music or you use Max MSP to make experimental music or you use Logic, you know, Pro Tools to make um, pop or rock music, you know. Um, and uh, by looking at Martin's life, you're, you're having a window into this other world, into this other historical time when those parameters, those um, softwares didn't exist mm. and, and how he did it and how they did it at that time. Mm. So it's, again, it's like, you know, learning from the elders and learning from this other, mm. this other community, this other time. Mm. And hopefully that's an, an edifying experience and a nourishing experience for people like myself that didn't grow grew up in that world you know they don't take these things for granted no no for sure no I think there is this kind of idea yeah I mean that kind of idea of having the privilege to kind of feel immersed in a kind of a culture yeah. that's gone but also to be able to take something from that or to be able to kind of yeah. reassess the kind of what could have been and but how that what could have been still could be applied today I mean I don't know I mean I, I, I kind of you know I really see I mean this is maybe a kind of funny thing to say, but I, I suppose I, I do see a parallel between reading and making films, you know. Um, yeah, there's something to that. Hmm. You know, like, except it's just a, you know, a more visual, it's a visual and sensory experience. But, um, you know, I think poetry and literature and, you know, history and reading, you know, um, <clears throat> non nonfiction gives us windows into the into other worlds and 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 ideas of you know you know ways of developing our mm. our ideas um, and and forming ideas um, and that are out with our own purview you know or out with our own immediate culture so mm. we have this culture of riches that is the library you know mm. and um, and I see a parallel between the library and the archive, really. No, for sure, for sure. No, that makes that makes perfect sense. Also, in terms of, because I know, I mean, there is something about your film. I mean, it feels, yeah, you, you, they do come across like the work of an of a kind of an archivist or a kind of almost like a librarian who is kind of has gone into those places, has engaged, has taken huge amounts of time, and has then kind of presented their their set of interconnections based on that material. Yeah. But they're, you know, they're very authored and they're, and they're you know, very subjective. Oh, of course. Um, you know, pieces of research. But at, yeah, at the same time, I, you know, I, I only make a film if I feel like, I, as I said, if I can grow from it. But also if I feel like I can present something that I don't feel is, is already well-worn knowledge or, you know. Sure, sure. No, I think it's, I mean, moving on. No, no, 100%. No, I mean, moving on from, from um, music, I mean, I think one of the things that's, that's most kind of recognizable about, about your films is their specific rhythm. I think it's, it, I mean, it's, it's really unusual to kind of see, I think when one sees one of your films, it's like, oh, that's incredible. I mean, there's like a particular way of, yeah, I mean, I guess rhythm is the best way to describe it. You know, it's to do with combination of sound and music on the one hand, it's also to do with certain camera movements that, you know, often kind of a, in an abrupt or a kind of jerking kind of way. Also the kind of the speed of the editing, which is usually rapid. And in a sense, how those four different things kind of interact with one another and then produce a rhythm of each individual film. And can you maybe talk a little bit about that kind of idea of, of producing a rhythm on the level of how, how you actually put the film together and also kind of maybe the role of, of both editing and camera movement within that? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So I use um, I use a Bolex, um, or primarily I've used a Bolex up until uh, the last the last film on Chandra, and um, the Bolex has a hundred foot reels, mm. which is translates to two minutes forty five of film time, mm. um, before you have to change a reel, and um, there's no sound captured with the bow legs. So um, that 
is all immediate all, already a set of parameters you know sure. fixed parameters that you one needs to work with um the film has a latitude you know it, it can be you know 50 asa or 500 asa which restricts um how much light you know is required to expose mm. the film and um again I, I suppose have been informed very much by um, experimental, you know, traditions of experimental film and, and um, people like Peter Hutton and Robert Beavers and mm -hmm. Gregory Markopoulos and Margaret Tate um, or Warren Sombart. And, you know, I, with Gret, with with Markopoulos, there was this idea of of looking at the shot um, um, on the level of on an atomic level, you know, mm -hmm. on the level of a f one frame at a time, and then the after image of that, you know, frame when it goes into black, and then Peter Hutton, you know, he used black space between each shot. So each shot, he, he used longer shots, but each shot became almost like a, a painting mm -hmm. in itself. And, and he refused montage in most of his films were silent. Um, and then, you know, with someone like Robert Beavers, who's also been, you know, a big influence on me. The, the camera is, is like a roving eye, you know, yeah. it's an extension of, you know, consciousness, it's this um, being awake to the world, being awake to our, the surroundings and, and being drawn to certain objects or certain um, details and textures and perhaps privileging them over an objective view of, mm -hmm. of the surroundings, you know, of a landscape, you know. Um, taking objects and combining them with sound in a way that creates a, a very subjective and, and almost kind of cubist portrait mm -hmm. um, of a person or place that again reflects the individual desire, you know, of the, the desire of the, of the author to say something, you know, to show something um, that they have seen. And, um, you know, he said, he and kind of often talks about this idea of, of intuition and of not knowing and, and, you know, not knowing why you film something mm -hmm. and, but being drawn to it and still film and filming it and then knowing, maybe, maybe not even knowing in the editing process, you know, mm -hmm. so that this idea of intuition is so important and to guard that from um, explanation from having to, um, you know, defend the film from, from either from the viewer or from the critic or from a sponsor, you know, which is so often the case now. It's like, you know, films are, are not made slowly, lovingly, you know, personally. They're made in, in this industrial model where, yeah. where they're signed off by a committee of, <laughs> you know, no, no, I mean, those committees exist, obviously, in various contexts. They, they, they say whether, whether they're commercial or not. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if we, if we look at film more, more in this sort of authored perspective of single authorship, um, then I think these, these, the way of editing, you know, is really an intrinsic part. The rhythm of the editing is an intrinsic part of filmmaking. Mm. And what is it specifically about about celluloid that kind of attracts you? I mean, what what is it? Because I mean, I think it's what's also interesting. I mean, obviously, in when thinking then about the kind of the content of your films, this idea of okay, every person leaves a set of traces, and you know, kind of film works itself based on traces. So, I mean, there's a kind of obviously a parallel there, but also you know, obviously as we already talked about, you work a lot with archive material, and in a mm. sense. A lot of archive material from previous eras also, is also was orig originally shot on film, and you know, in, in some of your films, there is this kind of difficulty in being able to place. Okay, is that archive material or is that material that's been shot? And there is this kind of smudging of that of that boundary. 
And um, can you talk a little bit about, about celluloid and also the idea of, of how to kind of incorporate archive material with your own footage and that kind of both at a level of kind of conception, research and, and also editing? Yeah. Um, you might, might need to ask, prompt me on the last question again. Oh, um, it's lots of, it's lots of stuff I know. <laughs> uh, but um, in terms of celluloid, okay, so, I mean, it's really just a love story of, <laughs> uh, it's very romantic, you know, I, I started using it in Super 8 film and then, you know, gradually gravitated towards 16 mil millimeter and was just immediately, you mm. know, fell in love with the image, images that were produced and um, the color, the the way it rendered, mm. uh, the, the, the way the, the lenses render uh, objects and, and um, individuals. And so that, that um, pleasure, you know, the visual pleasure, in, in, and also I think, you know, maybe it is again about having these, this parameter, you know, these fixed mm -hmm. parameters and this instrument um, and seeing the film. A lot of filmmakers, I think, you know, their films are created on paper. You know, their films are, um, and the, they're made in collaboration with crews. And things like the camera or, you know, what microphone or what camera, or what lens. Yes, there's maybe like, you know, um, you know, they're made on a project to project basis and, and are usually governed by things like budget. Um, or what the DOP chooses to work with. Mm. Um, but I think when, when you are a filmmaker that has control of your own means of production, you need to be able to know it absolutely intimately. So if I were to get seduced by the new red camera or the new ARRI, you know, camera, uh, digital camera, I would probably spend most of my time <laughs> reading the manuals. So that's right. That then actually filming and, and looking through the lens. So there is that thing of, you know, I like filming. I like celluloid. I like the restrictions of a hundred foot rules. Um, I'm coming from this structural history where mm. the materiality um, was a political thing. You know, the materiality of film is a conscious decision, and it's and it's written into. The you know, the form is the content in many ways. Yeah, for sure. Um, sorry, it says my internet connection is unstable. Don't know. It's okay. You you went for a second, but I think you're back, which is cool. So that that um, yeah, and then you talked about those those issues about celluloid and um, and about working in a tradition again. I, I see it as as working within a, a tradition and a community mm. of of people that also work with choose celluloid. That doesn't mean to say that I don't have, um, you know, um, a sort of brotherhoods with other people or um, uh, solidarity with other filmmakers that don't work with celluloid. Um, but uh, I think there are definitely a, a community of people now around the world that um, is a, there's a solidarity in making. For sure. For and sticking sure. with celluloid, you know. Um, the archive actually is a really important point that you raised about the archive being on film. And I remember, I can't remember who, who it was that, that said to me that when they, when you looked at, when you look at things, when you grew up and, you know, when we grew up in the eighties, um, the TV news was still filmed on yeah. 60 mil. Mm. And things like game shows um, or, you know, stuff shot in studios were shot in video. Mm. So it was, it was the opposite. You know, it was like film was veracity. Film was truth. 
you know, film was the real world, you know, there's roughness, um, there's porousness um, mm. uh, of, of film um, before it had been replaced by video. And that's kind of what I grew up with. Um, and, and again, it makes this division between the archive and my own shop material questionable, you know. Mm -hmm. No, for sure, for sure. That makes perfect sense. Um, I mean, maybe to get to one last question. Um, I mean, obviously, a retrospective implies looking back, but I mean, obviously, the opposite of that, thinking about looking forward. Um, what are you, what are you working on, planning in terms of in terms of future film stuff? I mean, I I read somewhere that you were thinking about making a film about your dad. Um, after there was some text you wrote about um, about mum's cards, which suggested that you were working on something about that. And also maybe more generally, in terms of your filmmaking work, as opposed to the other work that you do, how does, how is that sort of, how do you negotiate those, that, those kind of moves back and forth between kind of doing films and then maybe doing sound work or installation work or whatever? Yeah, good question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> With difficulty. <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. That's so, pretty clear. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's kind of like um, Alistair Gray, the author, put it. Um, he used to always say like the the writing was like a holiday from the painting, and the painting was a holiday from the writing. <laughs> you know. So it's it's you the know. Holiday is nice. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is like. Sometimes it's like living two different lives, you know, it's yeah. alter ego. Um, but of course, they, they are so in, inextricably linked as well and mm. inform each other. Um, sometimes not always in, com in, in complement, but they do inform each other, you know. Mm. Um, and um, there are differences, and I don't want to erase those differences. I, know I enjoy those, those differences in, in, you know, music making the community of music making and um and and, uh, and making films mm -hmm. art. um yeah you mentioned my dad the film of my dad so um i'm doing this exhibition in glasgow called in index card uh, index cards and letters mm -hmm. and that um there's two sixty mil films one is mum's cards that you're showing exactly. and then and then the other is this compliment um to it or a kind of sister film to it called for for dan mm -hmm. and uh dan o'neill was um a close friend of my father's who's my father was australian he's he passed away in 2000 mm -hmm. and i never really knew him as an adult i i was a student when he died at, mm -hmm. at art school and um, he came from Australia. And so in this film, the film is based on an interview with his best friend who um, is trying to read, who had kept this huge archive of letters that my father had written to him oh, wow. in the 60s. Hmm. Um, but the problem is, so the film, um, was meant to be Dan reading these letters out. Um, but unfortunately, my dad's handwriting was so bad <laughs> that he he couldn't decipher, he couldn't decipher what they said. So I and and I had very limited time in Australia. I, I had to go to New Zealand to do an exhibition. So well again, like you know the film is it's a failure it's a fail it's a failed experiment you know it's it or it's um uh, uh, an experiment or or a beginning you know mm. and I, it's a kind of open ended film where you know it started off with one in ten and then it changed into something else you know it, it, mm. it became something else and so it's it's, it's film as contingency, you know, film as um, a reflection of, of life and that life sometimes fails us, you know, things. 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> for such a, for reasons that are kind of so, I mean, also that was so silly. It's like, okay, you write something that's like not clear, and then so so many years later, that I don't know. Yeah, and and, and you know, it's, it's the same thing about Patrick. It's like Patrick, you know, it's this life that's cut off, you know, by AIDS in his prime, you know, in 1982, and it's. Um, you know, it's, it's so frustrating, so frustrating, you know, and so tragic um, and incomplete. And the film, I think, reflects that, it reflects this mm, for sure. impression, an impression or, or a, an encounter and a fleeting one. Mm. And this is the same with for Dan, you know, it's like if, I, if he'd read the letters from start to end, it would have been a four-hour film, you know. <laughs> and and, it, and it, you know, it's not sure, you know. <laughs> yeah. no, that's interesting. It, it, it is this incomplete, fragmented, failed um, thing, but it's become also something else. It becomes a film about friendship. It becomes about Dan, Dan, mm. and about his library and about their relationship, and and you know. Because I fail, because we fail to do this intent, this thing that I imagined, it, it becomes something else, you know, mm -hmm. it becomes something beyond what I imagined it could be. And I think that's a great thing. I, I agree. I look forward to seeing it. Then, um, yeah, thank you very much for, um, for taking the I time. Think, this, I think this. that's maybe also a model for my filmmaking. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great then um yeah thank you very much and um yeah um hope to see hope to see that film at some point soon thank you james i'm really sad i can't be with you um i'm hoping that we can make it out there to madrid in you know a few months time that's that'd be great thank you take care